I'll be reading from John 10 and verses 11 through uh, 13, I think it is. No, is John uh, 10? Yeah, John, the 10th chapter. And I'm going to start reading at verse 11 and go through 18, talking about the good shepherd, Jesus as the good shepherd. Okay. Shall we? All right. And it reads as follows. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leave the sheep and flee. And the wolf catches them and scatters them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and are known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not in this fold, then also I must bring them, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Okay. Therefore, does not my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again? No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my father. May the Lord, the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Let Amen. us pray. Most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, it is once again that a few of your children have assembled ourselves out to the house of study, of worship, to study the out of their word. Father, we pause to say thank you because you are such a good God. You loved us so much that you sent your only son to lay down his life for all who believe. And Father, in doing so, he became the good shepherd who laid down his life. Man did not take his life. He willingly gave it because he came here to die and make a sin atonement for the world. Then Father, I ask that you just Touch all of the sick and shut in everywhere. You know who they are. You know their condition. And you have the power to heal. And I'm asking because I know you can. And I believe that you will. Because past history has proven to me that you can and you do hear and answer prayer. Then Father, I ask that you touch the bereaved whether it's from uh, on the ones that suffer from anxiety. And Father, when we have difficulties, we tend to be comfort uncomfortable. We experience anxiety and worry. Then Father, I ask that you just address all those issues, whether it's worry or bereave, uh, or just plain anxiety from the things that's going on in the world. Then touch those hearts that they may give their problems to you and leave them at your feet. Then, Father, I ask that you just touch this nation. Touch the hearts and the minds of men that they may turn from their wicked ways and turn to you, knowing within a shadow, without a shadow of a doubt, that you hear you will heal and you will certainly forgive because you are a forgiving God. You are a loving God. You are a caring God. And we just thank you for being God all by yourself. And Father, I pray this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. Okay. We have a, a good lesson. I, I was going to read another 
scripture, but unless somebody else have a scripture and a verse they want to get into. I want to say something about the shepherd. Every time I read this passage, Willie, I think of what a shepherd, what a pastor should be. The kind of person he should be. You read Jeremiah, you see all the false shepherds. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of false shepherds around. You know, they care for themselves when trouble comes. They don't care about the sheep, you know. But a good shepherd, a good pastor will lay down his life for his people. He will love his sheep. And he'll lay down his life for them. And I just every time you bring this passage up, I, I always think of the relationship of the pastor, the call of God, and how we should take care of his, his flock, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you were right on target with that. And that is, and as you was talking, uh, I was trying to find Ephesians 4 and 11 when he says, and he gave some uh, pastors true. and he gave some apostles. And, and, and in my uh, commentary, it really lays out uh, the role and the duties and responsibilities of a pastor. And, and what you were saying was that it just exactly what the the uh, the role and the duties of a pastor, and he's not he or she is not a hireling. He's there to protect the the flock, okay? Because each congregation that has a pastor, there's only one pastor. He is the under shepherd, knowing that Jesus Christ is the shepherd who is the good shepherd, okay? And we as the, uh, as the under shepherd of that, of that branch of Zion has a responsibility and a duty to devote him and himself to overseeing and the care and the spiritual needs of his or her congregation, okay? Uh, they, they're supposed, we are, and let me just rephrase it, we are supposed to teach the unmitigated truth of God's word. And we not only have to teach it in words, but we have to live Amen. a life of Christ so that not only will our congregation, I'll say the flock, be willing to follow us, but they will only emulate uh, our lives because we are living the Christian life. And that's what we as, as uh, our pastors are supposed to be doing. And it's all in the attributes or characteristics of a shepherd. And, and if I can uh, just say this is, and I'm reflecting here that the older pastors, they had these characteristics. They really loved their flock. They really cared about their congregation. And you know, they would go that extra mile for the needs, whether it was spiritual or physical needs of their congregation. You know, the church back well, used to be the center of getting your needs fulfilled, okay? It was not only the spiritual hospital, but it was, I would say, a community, I do I want to use the word activity center or the go-to center in the community. If you need a job, you went to the church because nine times out of 10, the pastor yeah. knew somebody who could give you, will get you a job. If you needed medical attention and needed, he would be directed, he could call somebody. He knew somebody at, the house, at a hospital. They had a fellowship with the hospital. And uh, even they had established relationship with at least one funeral home, at least one, that when there was a home, a life celebration, a one of his, his or her members, they was known that they were going to be taken care of, whether they had ample funds to do that or in insurance, but they cause they had a relationship with that funeral home. See, you, you, our churches got to get back to being 
the anchor in the community and not just being this pious <laughs> building sitting up there in the middle of a, uh, the community because they, the, we, we, when they said the church is that celestial city that's sitting at, at, on a hill, beckoning laws, but if you're not doing anything or meeting the needs in your community, you're not gonna get too many people come in there. And the Jesus model have yet to change. He met physical needs in order to get to their spiritual needs. Let me just kind of put it this way. If you had people in your congregation, and, and let me rephrase that. If we have people in our congregation and don't have no food in the house and they're sitting there hungry, they're not going to hear the message. And if they're sitting there with an eviction notice or a foreclosure notice, their minds is focused on how am I going to keep me in some place to live? Or how am I going to pay my light bill? The church may not be physically, financially to pay it, but there will be an intercessor between the congregant and the utility company because the pastor has to have that relationship and that respect from those uh, that he or she's interacting with in the, in, the, in the community. So that being said, then the pastor has to present him or herself faultless before me. Because if they don't, and when you go to them and say, uh, let's just say we go into DTE. We got folks, we have, I have members in my congregation that needs your assistance to work something out to keep their utilities on. They got small babies in the house, or they may be a senior, or they just may be a couple, uh, a single. Uh, and But if we, if that CEO of DTE see us in, in, in at, at drinking and partying, then what kind of respect are they going to have, folks? Just saying. <laughs> we are talking about characteristics of the good shepherd and the under shepherds of each congregation. So oh, when we, we yeah. say, I, I'm going to get to you. I just see you. I'm just sorry. Get, <laughs> I see you. Just I don't want to throw you off. I'm sorry. That's all right. I, I, we, when we say we are called by God, it takes, it's a big responsibility to shepherd a congregation. Because let's just say, if you have 150 members in your congregation, in our congregation, we have 150 different personalities. And each one of them is at a different level in their Christian growth and walk. Is our responsibility as a teacher and a preacher, uh, you know, we're to teach them and nurture them so they'll grow to the next level. It also is incumbent upon us as pastors and leaders of that congregation to really care about every member of that congregation and love them equally. Because what? We are emulating Christ. And he, we can't in, we're not emulating him if we have them big eyes and little use, or we have those certain ones who put more money in the, in the orphan pan than somebody else over there. Because I can tell you, 10 times out of 10, everybody is not on the same financial and economical level. Some people have, uh, have has a greater they have their their and if a different income levels, but if we have taught, and I notice I said we, I'm saying we as pastors have taught tithing, which incorporates faith 
and it's our stewardship, the person's stewardship, they will pay what they have to pay. They'll pay that 10% and say, this is a faith thing. I believe in God when he said, I will supply all of your needs according to who my riches and gross glory through whom Jesus Christ. There is no failure in God. And let me tell you something. And I know my students had no heard me say this. God is an on-time God. When we feel that we have gone to the last mile, here the man may be standing at the door with the shut off notice. God shows up. That's true. I have seen it happen so many times. You know, and, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna get to you, DJ. Let me say no, no, take it to, no I'm listening. That and I'm and this is a personal testimony of mine when I committed myself to time early in my life when I had just three boys, many to take care of, and wasn't making much money. My tithes was twelve dollars every two weeks. But you know what? I kept walking that faith walk and kept listening to the pastor when he said, the pastor, the deacons, and the superintendent sung the same song from the same film book by paying your tithe and let God take care of the rest. I had to walk it. And there were times and things just get off key that uh, it make me get back on key because he, and when the late deacon Johnny Smith, he was our deacon and a superintendent in our church, that he said, God will put holes in your pockets. And fast as you put the money in, it's gone. Well, <laughs> and, and, and I had, can tell you that I had witnessed, I lived to see that because in, in my spiritual growth, I would get in a situation by not managing very carefully. Some come up and I say, oh, I'll do this. But any time, and I had to get to this point that I, I don't care what's going on, I'm gonna write God's check first. And everything just falls out of place. I would practice that and then, you know, you're gonna, I know my students would say, you're gonna be tested. And he will, to see, have you remembered from when you fell off the wagon before and he had to get you back on because he would bring to your remembrance. Put me first. Okay, put me first, and he will take care of it. Because, and, and we still talk about this good shepherd, and we, uh, we talk about pastors. We have a big responsibility, and we're not in there for the money. You, if you're in for the money, I don't know what to tell you. I, I'm telling you, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so let me, but I have, let me just finish this point, and then I'll get back. I have grown to my ties is more than that. And the point that I'm trying to make here is this. Put God first. Do what he asked us to do as an individual and us as a pastors. As pastors, we must teach. We must nurture. We must love and we must care for our sheep of our congregation. Why? Because we, number one, has been called by God. And number two, uh, we are emulating the shepherd. Okay, Miss Annie, tell me what you got to tell. <laughs> I, I, look, I look at her video, I, I want to call her the hat. That's all I see is the hat. <laughs> Y'all, you see is the hat. I, I got my notes in here ready for the day, and I was uh, okay, but it really fell in line with what we're getting ready to go with, these, these, with, the, with my rest of my presentation. See, I, I enjoy my teaching lesson go. We can have some good conversation. Yeah. And you say this again, I get responses back from people who watches the videos after we, we, I, we uh, I just saw a face. Oh, <laughs> you just saw a face. Okay. <laughs> what you got to tell me, Miss Ed? No, I was just saying that I guess as a pastor, you know, you're almost you're a living example. That's of, a of what you, you are. You have to be a living example if you expect your flock to follow right righteously. You have to be that living example, and you can't 
Well, as the saying say, you can't preach what you don't know and you can't leave where you don't go. That's for sure. So you have to be like that guide and light. You just have to be a living example of what it is to be um, even a Christian. And it's not an easy walk. It's not an easy life to live. But in the end, there is a reward. But if you have to be, like I said, that living example of what it is to even to even live, no, to even live right, and how mm -hmm. you treat your fellow man, mm -hmm. you know, where you don't have to, where you don't, um, you can't have like favoritism. I know sometimes you have, you, well, they say even in families, sometimes the mother always does have that favorite child, although she tries not to show it. When you can't show too much favoritism, you have to show where everything is balanced and everything is equal. That's what I was pretty much saying. Well, since you said it that way, let me just expound on it uh, because that's called sibling, sometimes sibling rivalry. But I will tell you this on two levels. And earthly, that mother or that father has love for each one of his or their children in his heart, his or her heart. And just like God has love for each one of us in his heart, and he loves us all the same. Now, when we get out of line and keep being hard-headed with him, and he keep telling us, no, you do this, you don't do that, and we keep going on our little hard-headed way, he, he certainly will chastise us. But it's in the scripture, and I can't quote it right now, but he says, you are mine. If I don't chastise you, you, are not, you don't belong to me. Because what's mine, I'm going to chastise. And that's what I, I used to preach to my kids when I was they was doing and they coming up. I said, listen, you putting your knees under my table, and I'm going to work before 30 in the morning to make sure you have a roof over your head, food on your table, clothes on your back, and you're going to get an education. So now it's my rules in this house. I'm not going to abuse you. I'm going to love you. But when I spank you or have do discipline you with a belt is because I want your attention because I've told you and told you and you're not listening. On that note, we back. <laughs> we back. <laughs> We're going to continue this. Lord is my shepherd, 23rd Psalm. We are working on verse four. And what I thought I thought I was going to try and do is to share my screen with my notes. And and let me know if you can see them. Okay. Uh, uh, share. No, I don't want to say Well, the that. notes are good, but Billy, I have bad eyesight. Oh, okay. Neck, well, let's can, not do I that. Can hardly, I, can hardly, I can see just some, might be a line at a time or a word at a time. It takes me a long time to read. Okay, well. But, but I see yeah. your notes. You see my notes? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, let's just. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to make you feel bad because I know you have bad eyesight. Okay. That's right. You don't make me feel bad. Okay. I so we we starting at. So let's say it, I can go back and keep on doing it the way we were doing. We can get out of the start. Just, just, oh, I can see it. But he said he can't have. See oh, it, okay. But, yeah. Well, I can see. I can see a little bit of your. I can see enough of one eye. You almost okay. make out the word. So. If okay, the, let me see is, if I can I can make it bigger. Well, your print is okay. It's uh, I think it's all right. I I think I can make it even if I can't. Uh huh. I'm gonna be yeah. talking now. Trust me, I'm gonna be running this mouth of mine. Let me talking about the Lord. That's that's a. She's really that's, getting through. She's really getting through the notes now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm going to uh, upload. I'm gonna increase it so you can be okay. able to see. There you How's go. that? That's better. Yeah, it's a little better. I can manage oh, it, I think. Okay. You can you can? I did it up oh. to 24. Okay. okay. Let's let's do okay. Starting it, we left off at verse four. And it says this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That rod and that staff, they comfort me. And my question was, what is this verse saying to us? Well, it is saying this, whatever adverse situation that we may find ourselves in, the Lord is there with us and he will see us safely through, uh, he will see us safely through the situation. 
And I do have my pages out of order. I'm looking at my pages here. Uh, and it, uh, okay. If this brings in the focus, uh, verse uh, Matthew 28 and 20 B, when it says, Lo, I am with you even until the end of the world. And what that is talking about is when, when uh, Jesus was telling the disciples, they got it with that great commission, and he was, he was encouraging us not to be um, fearful or doubtful when we yeah. go in that. Now, the other thing is that when we, the verse is telling us, we have confidence in the Lord and his deliverance because of his faithfulness to his word of bringing us out of our adverse situation. Okay. Can I share, can yes. I share an experience along this line with you? Yes, sir. Well, when I was nine years old, I lived in the city of Yonkers. And I used to walk through the dark streets at night in Yonkers to go to Boy Scouts. I was okay. only nine years old. It was very dangerous. And uh, my mother put a little sign in my room. I don't know what motivated. She wasn't a Christian. She had this sign that says, Bless Savior, dear, be always near. Keep me from evil, harm, and fear. And you know, I used to walk through those city streets at night and that verse was always on my mind. Oh, okay. I know God kept me through that, but here's a personal experience of that. You know, God protecting us. I had that, the only thing I knew was that little prayer. Bless Savior, dear, be always near. Keep me from evil, harm, and fear. And he did it. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. That's, well, you know what? Um <sighs> Our parents gave us some helpful, practical, principle nuggets that had biblical, was biblically based, okay? And because I can remember a lot of those little things that my mother have taught me and that uh, they have come as I've been growing and in maturing and in this faith walk, have come to mean so much. And I tried to pass them on to my children and hopefully they will uh, listen. And, I, and I, 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 I will feel this way. That's like my mother used to tell me, just keep living. They'll all come into fruition and have a, 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 a more profound meaning uh, of us as we grow older and they have and I and, and this is the one verse that my my mother is a prayer that my mother taught me when I early on we have a reverence well did not lay me down to sleep I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake to pray the Lord my soul to take it took me a while to understand what she was saying that the teaching me of that prayer and the principle that, that you know if Lord if I have something to happen and I don't wake up in the morning, take my soul back to heaven with you. Then the other uh, life principle that really has made a profound impact on my life is that have a reverence for God and she would teach me why and respect for my fellow man because she used to say, if you disrespect your fellow man you have already disrespected yourself you got to respect yourself first and then respect your fellow man and she said now there is a god make no mistake about it when we look at all that we can see of creation around us and we recognize the fact that i didn't put it there i can't call the trees to grow I can't cause the wind and the blow or the storm clouds to roll and billow. I can't do that. You know, I cannot call nor stop the lightning from flashing and dancing across the sky. And they had, she had this one, she said, when God and the thunder and lightning and storms are raging, you get somewhere and sit down because God is doing his work and we're going to respect him and give him his reverence and be quiet. They don't do that anymore. 
<laughs> and be just a talking on the telephone and the TV's playing and it just storming up a breeze. But back to this. Um, we see God's presence. Even in the midst of the storms and the lightning and flashing, God's presence is with us. He have his protective hand all around us. And I can say, as we are read from that scripture, in the, his presence is there and he feels in the form of a rod, which is a short club used for, as a defensive purpose when the, sheep is, when the shepherd is protecting his sheep. And the author put it there, author David, because he was getting, trying to make sure that people understood the, the rod and the staff of God and what they was used for and, and how the, the sheep was protecting his flock. And he explained this, the, this, the, the staff, you know, and he used it to draw the sheep back to the fold or guide them back to safety. And I, if I can remember, if my memory serves me correctly, that we talked about last week, that him being the good shepherd, he directs us to a path of safety. He's leading us. And that is part of his, his responsibility as the, as the shepherd. And it so is, it is with us as pastors. And we are guiding our shepherd, our sheep, our, con our sheep congregation and safety because we, we always sometimes should say, you know, we are no, if you're a believer, you are no longer in this, we are in the world, but we are no longer of this world. What this worldliness that's going on, we stay clear of it because there's trouble. And I can remember teaching my children, uh, preaching this and they're adoctrinating them. You will never claim the streets. The streets is much tougher than you are. At a certain time, and I said it, this upstanding young men and women is in the house at a certain time. <laughs> you Christians don't be hanging out in the bars at three o'clock in the morning. And and I said, you know, there's a certain time that they have they they have that much respect for themselves that I it's time for me to go home because it's you we need a good night's sleep. That safety is in your house. Uh at one time we were so safe, we didn't even need to uh lock our doors. Now we have locks on the locks on the doors. So when we can take God's protective rod and staff, this is goodness and his mercy, these symbolizes God's strength and his all power, just as he is all knowing and as he's everywhere. Okay, but let's look at another this. Knowing that we have the presence of God when we are facing adversity. And we can reflect on different scriptures to help us get through the situation. And Isaiah 10, 41 and 10 comes to mind when he tells us plainly, listen, fear not, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. If I'm your God, I'm going to protect you. If I'm your shepherd, I'm going to protect you. Unlike the heroin who's going to run off and leave you. I'm going to be here to protect you. Then I'm going to take you to safety. He said, I will be with you. I'm going to help you. He said, even goes on to tell us, I'm going to uphold you with the right hand of my right hand, which I'm going to do things the right way. We may have gotten off by looking at the world and his sub seemingly successful, but it is not. It's because it's short bed. When we've had this Sunday school lesson, when we achieve what we achieve in this life materially the right way and not scheming and cheating other people, then we'll be blessed for doing so. Because God always blesses us. And he blesses us not just for our own sake, but to be a blessing to others. So 
Uh, and I can't stress this enough that when we have the assurances from our good shepherd, the Lord, that whatever, whatever adversities we gonna we go through, we have the Lord with us because of who He is, our shepherd. Now, uh, if we, as we keep on going through these. He talks about verse five when he outlined that what all else he does for it. I don't care how much the enemy is around you. When it, I'm talking about verse five, when he said, Thou prepares a table, who the thou the God, our good shepherd, prepares a table for, us, even in the presence of my enemy. He said, They all can be all around you, but I want you to understand something. I'm here. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to feed you. And your enemy won't be able to touch you. He said, now, nah, because of what? I am your shepherd. And I'm here for you to the bitter end. I don't care what happens over here or over there. I'm always with you. And he tells us that even in the midst of our troubles, um, He's there. And he's providing for us. Let's just look at it. Go back to something I said. Might have said earlier that when we are uh, in the midst of a adverse situation, a bad situation, uh, say there is no food on the table, or we are running low of food in the refrigerator, he provides for us, and he does it so nicely through many different ways. Let's look at this pandemic and how many food banks and, and food uh, distribution centers have opened up and people can just go and don't ever have to get out of their car. Just drive up to the center, uh, to the site and get your food and tell them how many is in your family and they'll load up your truck. That's still God provision of care and providing for us because this pandemic is our enemy or people, or take stuff from us, but he still comes to our rescue. You know, it reminds me also when it says prepare, when he says um, he prepares the table, it kind of leads almost into um, when the Lord was preparing the Last Supper. And even during that Last Supper, he was able to tell each and every one of those disciples what they were even going to do even afterwards. Even He even knew when Judas was sitting at the table with him. And Judas at that time, it almost became an enemy of Christ mm -hmm. because he said, you're going to betray me. So he's even letting you know that even to even through the bitter end, um, when he knew that he was getting ready to prepare to go to the cross. And that's what that scripture reminds me of. Is even He's even letting you know that even when I prepare, I was preparing for the Last Supper, I'm still with you. Um, you might not be able to see me, but you always know that I'm there. Okay. All right. Yeah. He is true to his word. He's not going to leave us. He's going to be there for us. Even if the forces of evil have come upon us and they're trying to destroy our lives and our souls, God tells us one thing. Fear not. And when we can have that kind of assurances, knowing that there's no failure in our God, then we can live out our lives in peace, comfort, and joy. You know why? Because we are focused on him instead of our situation. We have given him the situation which he asked us to do. He said, now I want you to just take your cares and your and give them to me. I got this. I'll handle this. I want you to go and leave it alone and let me handle it. And when we do that, guess what? Everything works out. And it just, it, and before we know it, it has worked out so well that we almost sometimes forget we was in a mess. I'm going to tell you this story and I'm going to keep going on. It's about a a mule, right? 
that he'd gotten older. Well, the men in the neighborhood, the farmers, decided he was no, the mule was no more good. They dug this big old trench and they threw him over in him, and they're going to put dirt over him. They bury him a lot. The more dirt they put on this old mule, he just kept walking it down, walking it down. The more they put, he just kept walking it down. And pretty soon, the mule just walked right on out. Across the ground, he had packed the dirt down so he could walk about the ditch. So the point of what he said, so what are you talking about? How did that? Because when we give Jesus our problem, regardless of how much the enemy comes at us, he keep lifting our heads above it and we just keep on walking by faith in him, knowing that we okay. I'm okay. The evildoers might be having an issue because they don't understand how I can be skipping along down the road, looking at them smiling and saying, how you doing? God loves you, so do I. And they're just scrambling and it's going to what can I do to make her life evil? Can I do this? Can I put a stumbling block here? We don't have to worry about that. Just let God handle it, okay? And we know this, and I'm almost about finished, that we are protected by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his broken body, that he shed all that for us on Calvary's cross. He did so, so that we could live in righteousness and in a harmonious relationship with him. And then to the other thing, we are anointed with the oil, which is God, the Holy Spirit, with his special anointing on all believers till it just overflows our, our cups as our lives with his daily blessings. When you stop to think about just how blessed we are each day, each day, do you really think it's a blessing just to wake up in the morning? I hope so, because it is. There's so many of them that didn't make the cut. <laughs> and we can move. Yeah, we might, my knee might be hurting, but I can still walk around, get up and down the steps. You know, when we take all of those in, consideration and I each day and each day now to the next day and each day until we get 365 days that makes one year and after then we start the year all over and we add all those years up and we look around we have had a blessed life a long life some of us is living past 60 years of age you know, scripture says, what, three scores and 10? We have those kind of blessings. And we should be, we must be thankful because of the God that we have as our good shepherd that loves us so much. Whatever we go through, we are not alone. We have a good shepherd that will lay down his life for us and take and protect us. And he did, and Jesus Christ shed blood on, on Calvary's cross so that we will spend eternity with him forever. And that is something to be praised. It's something that we should Thank God for every day. Yes. It's praiseworthy and it is really an expression of our gratitude to the shepherd, the good shepherd. Questions or comments? We have maybe about 10 minutes. I am. Um, nope. I can see I can see your notes now. I have a headset. No. Oh, okay. So I can see your you know it's fairly good now. I, I can see it just like you read. Okay. I, I can okay. see it better with the headsets on, so I was able to read some of this stuff. Okay. All right. Well, we are almost at the end of our lesson. 
if uh, no more questions or comments, we'll close out in prayer. And I thank you for all of your participation, your lively comments and discussion questions. So who wanna close us in prayer? I'll close. Okay. Lord, as we think about you being our shepherd, how you care for us and take care of us and protect us. Lord, sometimes we don't realize it's happening. But Father, it comes obvious when we're afraid. We see that you're there to help us and we thank you. And Lord, we help, we hope, we pray that we will be like good sheep. We will hear your voice, we'll follow you. Yes, Lord. We'll, we'll love you, your, your word. Lord, we pray that as good sheep who have been fed properly, that we may uh, somehow be able to expend the blessing to other people that need to hear the message. Yes, thank yes. Thank you for your goodness and your love. And we thank you for our teacher for the lesson this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.